Our scripture reading today is Luke 14, verses 27 through 33. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, doesn't sit down first and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I distinctly remember at the tail end of the recession. So this is maybe 2010. The recession was in 2008. Around 2010, uh, ended worship at the church I was an associate at. Went to the back and was greeting people. And this woman came up to me and, um, you know, I'm just shaking hands and she gives me a big old hug. I think, well, she's never done that before. Uh, so then starts to tell me, you know, this week I quit my six-figure job and I'm going to work at a nonprofit called Main, Main Gate Therapeutic Horse Riding, you know, place. Jim Kaiser can tell you all about it. And my exclamation was, why? Why would you quit a six-figure job to go work at a nonprofit where you're probably not getting paid six figures at a nonprofit? And she said, well, it's all your fault. And I said, how? <laughs> and she goes, well, you did a sermon three weeks ago that talked about how we are called to give all of our lives to Jesus. How Jesus says that those who don't sell all of their possessions, cannot become their disciples. It even says earlier in the text that we didn't read, if you don't hate your mother and your father and your brother and sister, in fact, if you don't hate your life, you can't follow me. And I thought I should do something about that. And I remember two feelings of panic that came inside of me. The first was, oh my gosh, it was my fault that her tithe is going to be cut. And the senior pastor is going to be really upset with me. The second moment of panic I had was, people are actually listening. And people are actually invested. I'd only been preaching regularly for about a year and a half, maybe two years at this time. And I think up until this point, I thought, well, okay, this is a nice presentation on Sunday morning, but I wasn't completely confident that there were people who throughout their 40 hour, 60 hour, 80 hour, so many hours outside of church were wanting to do exactly what Jesus was telling them to do, that they had fully invested and bought in to this idea of a kingdom that Jesus talks about in Luke 4, and he says, the kingdom of the Lord is upon us, right? And it's a kingdom with images of no more tears anymore from suffering, and it's a kingdom with no more poverty anymore where justice reigns. It's a, it's a kingdom where we don't have divisiveness, we don't have terrorists, we don't have any of those things because there is a mutual mercy toward each other. And it just struck me to the core that there was somebody who was deeply trying to follow this in every aspect of their life. Now contrast this with um, later in, uh, so this was 2010, later in the year during Lent, um, the senior pastor and I led a Bible study uh, on Wednesday nights that was centering around learning different practices of prayer. And so we had, you know, 35, 40 people sign up for this class, and they were all in this one big room together. But we, we timed it around 6.30, thinking, well, it's, it's not going to be too late that people will get tired, but it's not going to be too uh, early that people can't get off work and get there in time. So we would show up at 6.30, and out of the 30 or 40 people that would come each week, um, there'd be about 10 there at 6.30, because they're kind of a crowd like y'all. They show up 15 minutes late to everything. Um, so... 
they would all kind of trickle in, but invariably, we would have people that would show up halfway through, or sometimes people would show up just with 15 minutes left in the entire class, and the excuse was always the same. I'm sorry, I couldn't get off work at the time. You know, I couldn't get off work in time. It was a crazy shift. I had no idea this was going to happen. It was something that would pop up, or, or it was even just, you know what, traffic on 75 was worse today than it normally is. There was a guy named Jared, and Jared um, started coming to the church about the same time as Heather, who was the woman who had quit her job, but, but Heather had been in church her entire life. Um, Jared, I had baptized just a few months before this Bible study on prayer had actually started, um, and I remember, you know, kneeling with him and, and placing my hands on his head. It was this great spiritual moment uh, of welcoming into the kingdom of God, but um, Jared, being this kind of new convert to Christianity, was absolutely on fire for doing everything he could to satisfy the will of God and to show the love of Jesus in the world. And, and Jared was a firefighter. Uh, and so Jared really never knew what his shift was going to bring. You know, you're not off shift if you are fighting a fire and five o'clock rings, right? You've got to stay there and fight the fire and save the lives and do everything that you can. So Jared was consistently late or he consistently missed, and he carried this huge weight of shame that for some reason he wasn't living up to the Jesus who says, if you don't sell all your possessions, you can't be a my disciple. He was carrying this huge weight of, if you don't hate your mother and father and follow me, then you cannot be my disciple. Because he so desperately wanted to be the disciple, but work got in the way. And it hasn't just been firefighters that I have seen who have had this struggle. I mean, it is corporate executives, it is uh, teachers in the classroom, it is volunteers at Heritage Ranch, it is all sorts of people who so desperately love the church and love Jesus and want everything to be centered around Christ, but there are certain elements in their life in which they just can't make that jump, or they have to put food on the table, or have a house, or have running water, lots of things that are important to survival and life in this world. And those come because we work. And you know, all they had ever heard the church talk about in terms of work was this word calling. And the church for centuries has exalted people who have felt called into these big extravagant lifestyles. Maybe it's a young kid who gets called into the ministry in high school and becomes a preacher. It's the, the monks and the nuns of the world that we look at and we say, goodness gracious, they're giving their all for Jesus. I could never do something like that. It's Mother Teresa who gives her life for the gospel. It's missionaries who feel called to a far-off place, or even those who feel called to nonprofit work through ministries here in the States. It's this big word calling that always entails this huge Samuel-esque narrative of, I'm giving my entire life and I'm never going to leave the temple. In fact, my mom is just going to give me up because the calling is so strong. And so all the church has ever talked about in terms of work is really giving everything up. You know the problem with that? The problem even with what existed in the temple, the problem that sometimes exists in church in 21st century Texas, is that when we talk about big callings like this, and we only talk about those people who are serving the distinct entity of the church, we segment our spirituality and we segment our discipleship into anything that has explicit church, Christian, Jesus name on it. That it only can be within the confines of the church or the ministries of the church that we are able to be disciples in the world, when really, when we read through the understanding of humanity in terms of God's creation in Genesis, what were we created to do? We were created to work. We were created to steward and shepherd the earth and creation. And back in those times, the church didn't exist. We weren't called to just funnel one hour a week into worship, we were called to worship God with everything that we did. We were called to give it all to Christ. I have to let you know that in Luke 14, when Jesus is saying, you have to hate your mother and father and brother and sister to follow me, I just need you to know that Jesus was having a bad day at the office. Right? Call this a case of, of Christ-like road rage, if you will. Um, earlier in 
chapter 14, all of the people that God has been investing in this entire time in terms of the nation of Israel, the Pharisees, I mean, they're part of the Sadducees. There's lots of different priestly groups, but the Pharisees, Jesus has just had a meal with these guys. And during the meal, everything that has been invested in them all the laws that talk about mercy and humility, all the values and characteristics of the kingdom in terms of uh, togetherness and forgiveness that they are supposed to have been invested in, that God has been investing in them, uh, Jesus realizes they don't care. It's the same kind of feeling that I, I used to think was true of, you know what, I'm going to give this great message and maybe one person's going to take something from it. But what Jesus finds in this moment with the Pharisees is they have had everything poured into them. They have all the responsibility into much who has been given. Much is to be expected. But the Pharisees are just turning a blind eye to everything that's been invested in them in favor of their own selves. They go to church for one hour a week, and they're really spiritual, and they raise their hands high, as Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, but then they go about their work week, and they completely are devoid of anything that God would have them do. Because it's been segmented. It's never been told to them, or at least they have lost the understanding that when we go to work, when we do that thing that takes up the majority of our time, it is our primary way of showing God that we care, of living into our discipleship. And in fact, if you look at what makes the world work, what drives the trajectory of the world, it's not necessarily the church, it's not necessarily the politics, it's not necessarily sports. It's the economy. The economy is what drives development, sustainability. The economy, the economy is where we make the biggest impact. And so we want to spend the next couple of weeks talking about how we can use work or find work as worship. And there's a few different ways I want to lift up to you today in terms of how we invest our time that we spend at work. The first one is your corporate culture. And I don't care if it is a volunteer with the PTA or if you happen to be the CEO of Amazon. And if you are the CEO of Amazon, let's go to lunch afterward because I have a great proposition for how you can use your money um, in many different ways and to use your money. But corporate culture is one of those things. Um, my friend works in uh, medical staffing. He works in a medical recruitment um, agency and and the way that they they have a base salary but the way that they really make their money is every time they make a connection they get a they get a commission off of this and so he described his corporate culture as every day I go to work in the Colosseum and it's a battle of which gladiator is going to survive in the long enough in terms to get the promotion or to get the raise when they walk into their workplace they see the other person as a threat they see the other person as competition and the enemy. And, and what we learn from Scripture, we can look at um, Proverbs 27, 17. It talks about iron sharpens iron. We can look at what's on the screen, Psalm 145, 4, that is this extolation of one generation shall laud your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. There's an expectation in Scripture that we are mentoring each other and caring for each other and looking out for each other. The expectation in Scripture is not that we were dinosaurs trying to chomp each other down to bits at every single moment of the day. And whether you are the entry-level secretary when people see, who people see when they first come into the office, or you're the CEO, or you're the volunteer, you have an influence, an investment into what the corporate culture of your workplace looks like. You have the ability to invest in your employees or coworkers what their lives are going to look like. And it may not be always Christ language, but it can be Christ values. See, that's one of the things that I think we need to remember. It's just because it doesn't carry the name Jesus with it doesn't mean it can't be a kingdom seed planted. Humility, kindness, Compassion, mercy, sacrificial love. These are the kind of things that you can instill within your corporate, corporate culture, the investment you can make so that those people you work with, when they go home, they don't feel like they just survived the Colosseum and then are going to take it out on their family at home. What they experienced was a loving, graceful presence that inspires them to go and share that with the kids that they are raising or the spouse that they have at home. What they experience from you is the love of Christ that 
compels them to go love someone beyond the workplace. The first thing that we can do to invest through our work, no matter if you are in food service or finance, is you can invest in people. And this is something that if you are anything from a volunteer to the CEO, whether you love your job or hate your job, or if you find any purpose toward the kingdom in your job, or you're just doing it so you can afford sports tickets, right? You can invest in the people around you the kingdom seeds of Jesus so that they can experience the love of God for 40 to 60 hours a week. The second thing we can do is know our corporate purpose. And this is one of those things, and I put James 3.1 associated with this. Um, this, this. It's a kind of a misuse of the t- scripture, I realize, for those of you who really know James. But it, it talks about how leaders will be judged more harshly. Um, but what I gather from this is that a leader knows the purpose. A leader knows the vision. In Luke 14, Jesus says that anybody who goes to build a tower without first knowing the end goal and everything it's going to take is going to look foolish if they don't know what the end goal actually is. Or the king who goes out without being prepared is going to look pretty foolish. Uh, that we are called in our work to know the outcome or expect the outcome and work toward that outcome. And when we go to our workplaces, I wonder how many of us just go and we punch buttons and we hit keys and we just don't care about the end purpose of our corporate culture. Because maybe we don't want to be judged more harshly. Maybe we don't really want to be on the chopping block for how the outcome is going to go. Maybe we just want to do our work and get on with it. But part of using our work as worship is knowing the impact that it's going to make in terms of the purpose of the company. If you work for Southwest Airlines, you can look at your job and say that I am connecting loved ones across the country at reasonable fare so they can get there fast with a, what, seven-minute turnaround or something like that. And if I do my job well and they don't crash, that's a really good day. Right? I can even look. If you are an insurance, a customer service rep for an insurance agency, I get it. People hate you. And it's not your fault. It's the adjuster's fault. You just get to deal with them. But what you can look at your job as doing is helping people who are dealing with life-changing costs to not have to have their life altered in a negative way because of the product that you are a part of. Knowing your corporate purpose, knowing where you are benefiting the customer or the people that you're working with is a vital part of using our work as worship, as being a part of that Genesis creation. If you find out that you work in a textile factory that is manufacturing white hoods for the KKK and you call yourself a Christian, you might want to rethink your place of employment. You might want to rethink what is going on if we are truly hearing Luke 14, if Those who do not give all of their possessions cannot be my disciple. And the third thing here, community transformation. And there are about a zillion scriptures I could have used here. In fact, there are over a hundred scriptures that talk about that when we are gleaning our fields as farmers, we should leave some on the fringes for the poor to gather. That when we are banking, we should not charge interest to the poor because they can't keep up with it. There are a zillion scriptures that talk about the community transformation and the community life that we share between the rich, between the poor, between the left out, between the included, between the powerful and the not powerful, between the boss and the employee, that our community ought to be transformed by how we perform our work, by what our work does. And and I mentioned earlier, right, the economy drives everything. Let me put it in church speak here for a little bit. When I came to Creekwood in 2015, I distinctly remember our youth minister at Stonebridge um, would make a big deal. There were 82 churches in Collin County um, at the time when I came here. That was about six and a half years ago. There were 82 churches in Collin County. I looked it up last night. There are 123 churches in Collin County. So I know at least five that have closed and probably more because churches close, unfortunately, all the time and new churches spring up. So in six and a half years, there is an estimated 46 churches that have started in Collin County. Now let me ask you where in Collin County you think they started. Raise your hand if you think it was Van Alstine. Wrong. Right? Raise your hand if you think it was Gunner. No, not Max. No, not Gunner. Right? Right? Raise your hand if you think it was McKinney. Raise your hand if you think it was Allen. Raise your hand if you think it was Plano. Raise your hand if you think it was Frisco. 
All right, what's the commonality between those four versus Gunner and Van Alstine? Growth and money, right? Acts 29 is a, a church, planning, um, church planning network, and, and one of the first questions they're praying about as they are looking to send church planners out is, can they financially support the church? And that's an important thing, right? You heard Matthew and Linda talk about the investment. I mean, what you give matters. You make ministry happen by the gifts that you offer. But there's this old axiom in Baptist preacher language um, that some of you may have heard that no preacher has ever been called to a smaller church that pays less. Right? There's so many stories in the Bible of Abraham being called out of security from Ur to go into the promised land and the Israelites to go from you know, at least having food on the table into the wilderness for 40 years, right? Most of Scripture is leave this great place and go to this not-so-great place um, to do the Lord's work. But in church world, for whatever, we plant churches where we already know there are people who can support it, maybe not the people who need it the most. And I'm not saying that rich people don't need Jesus too, because Lord knows we all do, but, right, how many churches do you think got planted in Hunt County, or Raines County, or Red River County, in the same time frame. How many churches do you think got planted in South Dallas in the last six years? I was just thinking about this in economic terms. There was this memory that popped up. And for whatever reason, I just distinctly remember this news story about former L.A. Laker basketball legend Magic Johnson opening a movie theater. And I kept trying to figure out why am I remembering this random news story about him opening a, a movie theater. But it was because he opened it in South Central Los Angeles. At a time after, like, the OJ stuff happened and, and all the riots that had happened associated with that, and the area was economically completely disparaged and disadvantaged, and there were gang activity. No business owner in their right mind, no venture capitalist, is going to go into South Central Los Angeles and say, let's open up a really luxurious movie theater for these people, thinking that it's going to be financially, uh, solve, you know, financially uh, able to survive, or that it's going to be a good thing, and they probably have vandalism on their mind. But, but Magic um, had had this experience. Um, those of you who have followed his career, his career ended abruptly when he was, uh, he had, he di- was diagnosed with HIV. He was HIV positive and you know, couldn't play in the league anymore. And, um, and a lot of people who had really been patting him on the back um, turned their back on him. And he said that the only people that stood by him during this tumultuous time of finding out he was HIV positive was this church in South Central Los Angeles that him and his wife went to. And those people stuck by him and they encouraged him and they had his back and they made sure he was always welcome and and they prayed for him left and right and day and night. And so he said, you know, these are the kind of people I want to invest in. And he had this vision for what he could do with his millions of dollars and business connections for the community of South Central Los Angeles. So his first thing was he knew in that culture they loved to go to the movies. So he built a movie theater, something they would truly enjoy. But you know what the movie theater also brought to young teenagers who may need another alternative to gangs? Was jobs. And so all of a sudden... Kids were working the popcorn stand and serving drinks and ushering and cleaning up and gaining a career path to assistant manager and potentially manager of the movie theater. And and he didn't stop there. He opened up other movie theaters and then he bought strip malls. And in those strip malls, he became the first partner that Howard Schultz and Starbucks ever took on in terms of opening up a new store. And who would have ever thought that in South Central Los Angeles, a Starbucks would work? But there was this article in 2000 in the New York Times where they interviewed Magic Johnson, where he was standing outside of his Starbucks, greeting people, shaking their hands, and pointing out, there's a young man on a laptop over there trading shares. There's a young man who went back to college because he worked at Starbucks and was able to afford the tuition for the community college right here, right? Magic had invested in the Starbucks, but not just in the Starbucks. And yes, he's making money hand over fist. He's doing quite well for himself uh, in in this economic terms. But the benefit he also has seen is while South Central Los Angeles is not Beverly Hills by any measure, it's a lot better than it was. Through his corporation, he's been able to employ 3,000 people in South Central Los Angeles who create an economic flow of money that create more investment in that community to create less opportunity for other bad things to creep in. 
what we do in work, whether it be investing in our employees and coworkers so that their lives are better and more kingdom-filled, or whether it be the corporate purpose that we are investing our time in, and the ultimate outcome of what's going to happen in the world, or whether it is how we can literally shape the community through the money that we make and the jobs that we create. This is all kingdom work. In 2 Corinthians, it tells us, in chapter 9, it says, those who sow little will reap little, and those who sow much will reap much. And if your work hours are 40 to 60 hours of your week, and let's not pretend that some of you aren't working 80 hours a week, those of you who aren't retired. And for those of you who are retired, I've heard you're busier than you are when you were working. All right, let's think about if we've got 40 to 80 hours that are consuming most of our waking moments, and this is what we have to sow, perhaps our work ought not to be segmented from our Christianity, but perhaps work is the main avenue in which we can create disciples in the world if we're willing to invest that time and our purpose in our work to the kingdom-building nature of Christ. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, help us to open our eyes to the opportunities around us. Entrepreneurial opportunities to invest in the lives of those who need your presence, both spiritually and uplifting and economically in poverty. To know that you are loving of those who are miserable and loving of those who need a hand up to make a better world where we can look on each other with kindness and equity. Lord God, may we not grow callous in the doggy dog world that we live in. May we not enter into a coliseum looking to fight another gladiator, but may we enter into a coliseum the way that Christians did when they gave their lives for the witness of your loving work in this world, perhaps even at their own detriment. Lord God, when you use the word missio for hate in Scripture, what you're telling us is that we simply need to not love anything more than we love you. So God, in all of our life, may we love you more than we love anything else. May we put you first through all of our time. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.